Looks like this Hangout is live. I'm Richard Dolan. I'm very happy to be here with you. I have a special guest for this broadcast. That's David O'Leary, uh, who is the creator of a new upcoming series called Project Blue Book, which is going to be featured on the History Channel starting January 8th, 2019. I've been fortunate in being able to see the episodes in advance, so that's my good fortune. Uh, and I'm very, really looking forward to talking with David about this uh, really interesting series. David O'Leary, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Richard. Thanks a lot. And sorry for the delay, guys. Technical issues on my end, totally my fault. So apologies. I worked it out. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the Chrome, ver Chrome versus Safari. Chrome versus Safari and Chrome is superior and I'm still that, using Safari. That always and, shouldn't be. and yeah, as, as, that's fine. Um, so I'm really glad you're here. And um, I've been looking forward to doing this interview with you. And as I just uh, mentioned to the uh, listeners, I I was privileged to be able to watch the series in advance. And I guess I'll just say this right up uh, at the beginning. And the reason is I was asked to uh, participate, I suppose, in this series as uh, one of the final uh, voices of historical context that, that end each episode. So you, you'll, you present a, a dramatization of yes. the life of J. Allen Hynek and the Project Blue Book scene. And at the end, they'll have, they have individuals such as Jacques Vallée, I, I believe, Paul Hynek, myself, yep. and we provide additional commentary. So that was nice. And as a result, uh, just last week, I had a History Channel team in my living room shooting me. Uh, oh, great. Episodes. That was fun. Yeah. Well, you know, that, and that's something that we, um, that we kind of conceived at the, in the very beginning, you know, that we would do some sort of, you know, to learn more about the real life case that inspired this week's episode of Blue Book, tune in after the show or go online or however they're going to do it. Because I think it's important for folks to know that um, while we are a dramatization for sure of these events, the, you know, every week we are rooting our episodes and our storylines in real life cases and real life facts. And I think it's important that a people, you know, know that and then that b people are able to separate the two as well and be like okay let's go back and look at the real case let's you know so that they understand that like you know we are um well we are 100 percent rooted in historical events and historical historical uh you know cases and things of that nature um you know we do yeah, of course we take some liberties we're not a uh we're not a documentary on project blue book although there are some wonderful documentaries out there um we are a dramatization uh you know sort of with the hopes to both um you know, educate and entertain, you know? Um, and uh, so so I, I love that we're doing this companion piece and I really love that you're involved, sir. So that's great. Thanks, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, my contribution comes out okay. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, yeah. But yeah, well, you, you mentioned something, I was gonna wait to, to jump in, but I might as well just ask, like there's always this uh, a little bit of like tension or, or um, it's a positive tension you could say between the dramatization and the historical reality. And you guys had to work your way through that. And I wonder, uh, how does that happen? Like, um, I listened to you in one previous interview and you talked about like the whole manner of how a TV show is produced. You mentioned people like showrunners who are uh, kind of experts in, I assume, in how a TV show is put together. But you have to also kind of marry that with what you know about the history. How does this whole process work out? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I guess I'll tell people just a little bit about how sort of how the show came to be and then yeah. absolutely answer that question, which was, you know, um, gosh, I mean, like for me, honestly, I, UFOs have been like a lifelong, you know, lifelong obsession. I grew up in New York City. Uh, I remember seeing like E.T. in theaters and like, you know, leaving M&Ms on my windowsill. I didn't eat Reese's Pieces, you know, at the time on my ninth floor windowsill. Um, I remember dragging my father to uh, to the the film adaptation of Whitley Stryber's best-selling New York Times book Communion uh, that they did with Christopher Walken when I was nine years old. So it was, you know, my interest in this subject matter go, goes as far back as I can remember. Um, but uh, you know, it was only sort of like later on that I really uh, sort uh, you know started to look at America's history with this subject matter and sort of and 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 realize wow just how 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 mysterious and amazing uh that really is and of course through the lens of the fact that there really was this like official government program that was looking into UFOs in the 1950s and 60s um and uh you know I was just fortunate enough to write a pilot that history saw potential in and and that they eventually uh felt would 
would make a great television series. Um, and in terms of like your, you know, your your other question, I think, which is really about sort of how you marry how you marry both, you know, the historical events and dramatization. It's it, it can be tricky, you know what I mean? Like because you really want to pay homage to the events that occurred because his, the, our history really is stranger than fiction in a lot of ways. And at the same time, like, you know, you have a dramatic series to tell and you have a, you know, a, you know, you want to make sure that, that, that you tell a gripping story and that you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're roping in your audience and keeping them engaged. So, you know, for us with Project Blue Book, we always knew the show was going to be called Project Blue Book. Now, of course, there were precursors to Project Blue Book, right? There was, there's Project Sign and there's Grudge and, um, so what we tried to do was, you know, the things that were important to us were, um, you know, rooting in real life cases every week, for sure, in real life events, um, for sure, getting, uh, getting Heineck as, you know, accurate as we could in terms of the portrayal of him as a man and a character. And for that, we looped in his two sons to be consulting producers on the show, which is Paul and Joel Heineck. And for them to just give us insights into the man and his journey and why they believe he, he switched sides. And, you know, for the, maybe just in case, like, you know, you know, the listening public out there isn't fully aware of who Dr. Alan Heineck is. Of course, he was the, uh, you know, he was an astrophysicist, uh, you know, civilian recruited by the U.S. Air Force to be the chief scientific advisor of Project Blue Book, who was a UFO skeptic when he started, who through, the, through his tenure working on Project Blue Book, essentially shifted sides, right, and became became uh, an outspoken uh, critic of Project Blue Book uh, and, and, belie and a believer that, that UFOs are worthy of scientific uh, study in a very serious way and felt that, uh, felt that they represent something that we truly have yet to understand that... Uh, that may just, you know, hold keys to like our place in the universe. Yes, I, if I can just add something to that, uh, Heineck really, he's complex, honestly, as a historical figure, but definitely an interesting man. And uh, I, I find the same thing when I review his career. He wrote a few books and there's a lot of other uh, information about Alan Heineck, including right. some books by um, Jacques Vallée who worked with him and, and wrote about Heineck and, and so yes. on. With Heineck, you do find he, um, was as I would characterize like a real team player during the 1950s, but a t in other words, willing to work with the Air Force, no problem. But it is true, he developed a, um, a very strong interest in this UFO subject. There was a, a speech that's available online that he gave back in 1960. So during the, uh, the real core of the Blue Book experience before uh, he had a kind of a public turnaround in the mid 60s, and even then, in 1960, speaking to an Air Force audience, and he's talking at great length about the complexity of the UFO phenomenon and right. how it deserved, even then, a very sophisticated interdisciplinary approach and that it really was serious. And so you really do see this, but, um, and I, I, one thing that I notice about the series, is the whole tension between the, the, the fiction and the, and the history, <clears throat> or the dramatization and the history, Sure. So you, you get Heineck's character, and then you also have really what I interpret as Edward Ruppelt's character. Correct. Uh, kind of like a stand-in. You have his uh, Captain Quinn. In right. The series. I, I like the acting in all of this, by the way. It's very oh, well good. done. And incidentally, uh, you have a, a first-rate uh, director. This is a guy who w did uh, Forrest Gump. Yeah. Um, what else am I missing? Some yeah, other not, maybe. Back to the Future contact. Back yeah, uh, he's got a movie coming out actually in theaters called uh, uh, "The Women of Marwin" uh, with Steve Carell. Yeah, the great, the great Bob Zemeckis, absolutely. Bob Zemeckis, thank which you, yeah. uh, you know, and listen for him. I mean, his involvement, you know, and I think this goes back to his contact days. It was really important for him that we that the show, while be intriguing and engaging and mysterious and and sort of tell a, a dramatic tale, feel and grounded and and always have these benchmarks, these beacons of truth that we could be like, no, like go look up the Gorman incident, go look up the Flatwoods yeah. Monster case, go look up the Lubbock Lights. Like you will see that these cases all really happened. And, and that certainly the, even in, in, in cases where there was some, was a explanation given by Blue Book that didn't necessarily ever satisfy the witnesses who in fact had these experiences. And in many times these witnesses were, you know, trained military personnel and, and commercial airline pilots and, and people who really should, should be trained, have a trained eye of what they see in the sky, you know I mean? And yeah. Heineken himself even at one point, I believe went out and, 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 uh, 
and interviewed uh, fellow astrophysicists who would who stare at the sky all day long and, and astronomers uh, sort of for their take on if they had seen uh, things that they couldn't identify in the sky as well and found some interesting results. So, you know, it, it's it's just one of the, you know, yeah. it's, it's a mystery that persists. Well, the, the thing that, oh, absolutely. Well, the thing that I noticed about having Hynek and the Air Force captain in this series together, so really the way it works, and this isn't giving anything away, they, they go on right. case after case investigating uh, UFO events that are actually part of the UFO lore. And, but it's like Hynek and Ruppelt, of course, never did a field investigation together, but right. I, I really like the way that you've got these two important figures of the 1950s, ufology, uh, right. together and you kind of bring them and the, the the Air Force captain's a little different than Edward Ruppelt from what I've learned historically. And indeed sure. the Hynek character on the show is a little different when I say than the Hynek that I understand historically. But this that's TV and I keep reminding myself, okay, this is TV. The way sure. that it, it happens is you get these two individuals and I think they're both very good vehicles for the investigation of the various cases. So you mentioned the Gorman case, right. uh, which for people who don't know, it's a really amazing case, kind of forgotten today, but yeah. I'm glad that you you bring it up from 1951. Um, 51, yeah. Uh, oh, the Gorman incident? Yeah, the Gorman incident, 1948, yeah. 48, yeah. And that's where, right, that's where an Air National Guardsman, George Gorman, uh, basically mm -hmm. claimed to have a dog fight with the UFO, right? That's right, yeah. Is, uh, unbelievable. You know? And it was there were a number of ground witnesses as well, and other other witnesses in the air. So yeah. it was actually well attested, and it was a, a light a light phenomenon that uh, utterly outmaneuvered him, and yeah. really was a, a truly freaky incident. So I I like that that was covered, and uh, and so on. Yeah. So yeah, I thought the vehicle that you used, like the 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 Heineck character, uh, of course yeah. Aiden Dillon yeah. from Game of Thrones, everyone knows him, and right. the uh, actor. Um, Michael Malarkey, who plays Michael Malarkey, the great Michael Malarkey. Yeah. Yes, well, you know, I mean, and one of the things that, you know, and I, and, and I trust that a lot of your listening public may know this, but maybe they don't, is of course that not only was the chief scientific advisor of Project Blue Book, you know, did he turn, you know, did his opinion of UFOs change over time working at Project Blue Book? So did the first director of Project Blue Book's opinion on UFOs. Like if you read Ed, Captain Ed Brutelt's 1956, uh, you know, a book called The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. He talks at length, kind of, it, it, it's a, and in some ways a scathing criticism of sort of Project Blue Book not taking this phenomena seriously enough. Um, you know, I'm paraphrasing the first sentence of the book, but the first sentence of the book is something like in the summer of 1952, you know, F-18s were scrambled to to chase after an anomaly in our skies that, you know, we didn't know what it was. So it's like, the book kind of grabs you right away. His book was, I say, you know, along with Heineck's books, huge, um, you know, uh, documents that we really uh, utilized and, 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 you know, uh, you know, worked with in terms of building the show. Like, you'll, you know, the cases that he talks about, you'll, you'll see are, are, are many of the cases that we end up exploring in the first season. And um, he's just a fast, he was such a fascinating character. So yes, teaming the two of them up where Heineck is really a man that's driven by science and where the, the path of science takes him and, and Michael Malarkey's character, uh, which is a uh, you know, loose composite of, of Captain Edward Pell, who's more driven by military duty, but both of them sort of start to realize, hey, there's more going on here, you know? Interesting side note, I'm not sure if this will ever be covered at any point in the series, Yeah. but in, in real life, Ruppelt, who really did write one of the very best books that you just mentioned, The Report on right. High Flying Objects, is a real classic. Yeah. Uh, not, back in 1956, after he left Blue Book, um, Interesting thing, you know, Ruppelt did sort of become very much turned into the, like believing that the UFOs were real, but then only a few years later, wrote a, uh, a follow-up to that That's first right. book in which he, That's right. he debunked himself. Yes, he did. And yes, then he died. Did. And then he died at 37 from a heart attack. Correct. Yeah, the, it's that, very I, weird. I, uh, when we were like pitching the show, when I, you know, when I was first pitching the show to the network and, and, uh, to you know, try to get the show greenlit to series and stuff like that. You know, part of the big piece of that was was all the mysterious deaths associated with Project Blue Book, and that was a seminal one in, in the fact that yeah, he he writes this scathing critique of Project Blue Book in '56. Mm -hmm. uh, then he writes a you know he kind of retracts that, writes a, a different version shortly before his death, and then dies anyway of this of this heart attack at the age of 37, despite him being kind of this you know healthy uh, 
you know, military guy. It's, 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 it's interesting. Yeah. There's, there's some questions there. He wrote, yeah, he wrote three additional chapters to that book. Right. We actually read like uh, someone in junior high school just trash talking against other people. It's really, it's a shocking, it's very unlike the yes. very measured, intelligent uh, book that he had written in 1956. That's right. That's uh, right. Really, and really I made sure that we got for the writers room and stuff like that that we got our hands on the original, just because I felt that was uh, that was more true to how he yeah. actually felt coming right out of the program. Well, this leads into something that you do in the series, if I may say, yeah. which is uh, sure. one thing I actually really did like a lot, uh, particularly was how the series brings in this kind of subterranean element to what's going on, because I think this was really true in the fifties. In other words. Uh, as in fact, this is mentioned in a trailer, uh, so I'm not giving much away here. But sure. the, the men in hats, as yes. you call it. the men so, in I, hats. I, I thought yes. oh, I laughed, but I thought that's actually really cool, uh, like men in black. That's and, right. And so, but there's this uh, subterranean, uh, because actually, even even during the 50s and certainly by the 60s, a lot of people were realizing Blue Book really wasn't the only game in town, and there were other types of investigations uh. going on. That's and right. so there's, so you get this um, a very cloak and dagger type of element that uh, weaves its way through the plot. Is there anything that you wanted to say about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like reports of sort of shadowy men, either intimidating UFO witnesses or, um, you know, trying to trying to just sort of like, you know, being on the scene of, 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 of cases and things like that goes all the way back. I mean, my, as far as I know, like the Maury Island incident, if you got for, for listeners familiar with that, that's one of the first cases that sort of speaks, speaks to that idea. Um, and certainly, and, you know, and, and I think, you know, a lot of people now when they think of men in black, they think like the Will Smith movies or something like that, but all, but really going all the way back, this is a, this is just a piece of this phenomenon that you, that you can't ignore. Um, Ed Rupelt himself, uh, in his book sort of talks about it. Um, you know, they, t there's, there's notions to the, I think it's called the 400, 4,600 air, air squadron division as sort of this other, uh, division of the military that is also investigating these yep. cases on the side. Um, and so we wanted to be truthful to that. We wanted to be truthful to the fact that many people would come forward in the fifties and would claim, you know, after they had had, they would report a sighting, people would show up at their door and kind of intimidate them or, you know, show up in these black Cadillacs and, and, and try to try to sort of say like, you didn't see what you said you saw. And if you tell anybody about it, um, you know, we're going to come back and things like, things like that. So we felt that we, we, you can't fully look at this, yeah, uh, you know, issue in this time period and UFOs in the 1950s without really exploring that. And what, and gosh, I mean, like it also just makes for some great, for some great, uh, you know, twists and turns in the show, but you know, it's one of those truth is stranger than fiction, uh, aspects that like, yes, blue book was not the only game in town and really project blue books function, at least according to men like Dr. J. Allen Hynek, what became, even though they were into the public and investigatory arm, they really were a public, disinformation campaign you know they were they were about going out there and explaining away um uh ufo sightings and heineck heineck felt that that was true as early as he started to sh sh you know shift sides like is this a really an investigatory arm or is this or is this something else as soon as you know as early as the the, the cia robertson panel in 53 where they would come in and they would present all the evidence and then they would change things from like possibly birds to probably birds, you know, and things of that nature. And, but, you know, he was a man who stayed on Project Blue Book because it gave him, he was a scientist. And then if you, and if you tow the company line, you get to have access to all these amazing cases. And if you come out there and you, you critique the, the program in which you are a part of, uh, they fire you and you don't get access to anything. And, and I think he rightfully made the right decision at the time to be like, I'm going to stay on and I'm going to continue searching and see, you know, what is it that they're hiding here? What is it that's being covered up here? So, Yeah, for sure. There's so much that actually is covered in these uh, first 10 episodes. Um, I'd love to ask about a couple of the cases. You, you mentioned Gorman case. Uh, sure. Uh, that's one. Um, before, I, before I ask you, I'm just wondering, uh, are there going to be plans for a second season to do follow-up because uh, there's- that, That's so our- that's our hope. Yes, please. You know, our hope is the, the, the initial sort of conceit of the show was that we would, we, there are so many great cases and like, I don't think in 10 episodes you can cover all of them. And I didn't, we didn't want to try. So what we tried to do is like, you know, I would say the timeline of the show takes place roughly from like 1951 to 1952. And we tried to be as true to that 
period as we could while also it, taking some liberties. You know, I would say that we explore mainly cases that took place from 1948 to 1953, you know, and then just pulling them in and, um, you know, and yes, like, you know, some things that are dramatized or the chronology and things like that. But right. the hope would be much like a, I don't know, I guess like Mad Men or something, which begins in the early 1950s and goes all the way through the 1960s, is that then, you know, for season two, we get to, now we get to maybe, you know, like kick off in 53 or, you know what I mean? And, and then explore another chunk of cases because there's just so many great ones. And there were cases that we would come up, you know, that would come up and I'd be like, oh, what about this case? But we didn't want... We just felt like, okay, let's, there's so many great cases just in this sliver of time. Let's focus on these. And then hopefully we get a chance to tell these other great stories too. You know, like, you know, I'd love to do Hopkinsville or, you know, I mean, all these other great ones that are just, that come up later, you know, but, uh, but hopefully we'll get that chance, you know, but that, that would be the idea. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I think there, well, there's certainly a lot of opportunity in the 1950s and in the sixties, of course. To, uh, to deal with this sort of a thing. So, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of, um, my gosh, uh, you know, where the whole thing comes to a head in the 1960s. Hynek's very much a part of that story, as, as you well know, and as all many listeners right. uh, yeah. know. That would be interesting to see. I would love yeah. to see that whole Yeah, I'd love to get to that, to that moment where he, like, you know, where he, where he comes out and he says swamp gas and he himself doesn't believe it and he hates himself for it. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many, um, you know, and then there's just some wonderful cases that he, that he, that really rocked him in the sixties as well. And, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're, you know, that would be our hope. I mean, you know, that's the knock on wood. We, you know, we get to tell all those stories, you know? Oh yeah, for sure. So some of the cases that have come up in this series, like uh Flatwoods monster case of 1952, yeah. that's, that's one of these cases that UFO researchers run in terror from because it's just so crazy, but, you can't really run from it because it was actually quite prominent at the time. And it's such a great, for me, it's such a great one because multiple, it, it, so for those not familiar with the case, the, the essential case is uh, a, a farm lady and a group of children of varying ages saw something mysterious crash out in the sky. When they went into the woods to investigate it, there was like this pungent mist in the air. It caused these mysterious burns on their faces. They, they, there was a dog that was with them that got them sick, all this kind of stuff. And then of course, Amidst amidst this craziness, they saw this what has become known as the Flatwoods Monster. But if you actually look at images of this thing, it's very strange. You know, it, it sort of fits very nicely into the sort of high strangeness that some UFO cases really have, where it's like, what is that? And they 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 all agreed that this is what they saw, and they all were terrified about it. And so yeah, it's one of those wonderful cases that like they explain. I don't want, actually. I don't want to say how they explain it away because we we do kind of do that justice on the show. Um, but there there were some logical answers to it. Um, but it's one of those cases where like yeah, like sure that satisfied the the, the public's curiosity. Never satisfied the witnesses curi You know what the witness claims w witnesses claim they saw. And these were multiple witnesses who had no reason to lie. Um, so it's one of those great cases. And, and that's what we try to do a little bit in the series too, is sort of, we, we try to not only sort of show the diversity of different types of UFO cases that are out there. Cause I think a lot of people, when they think of a UFO case, they just think of, um, you know, like the, the, the iconic, like flying disc in the sky or something like that. Mm -hmm. But there really is sort of a, a multitude of sort of ways in which this phenomenon occurs. So we try to be diverse in that regard as just sort of paint a whole paint a whole brush of sort of the, the full, the full experience. But then we, um, we also wanted to build, you know, we're trying to build an intensity and sort of, sort of show that like, listen, like, you know, you start, you can start out small, but as things go on, you're, you're going to see that, listen, there were many cases that had multiple sightings, credible witnesses, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's actually really true. And, um, and toward that end, like in the Flatwoods case, and in actually all of the ones that the episodes that I'm thinking of, you've got this uh, kind of subtext of, all right, so there's the scientific perplexity of this very unusual phenomenon. Right. Uh, but then you've got this other subtext of the political and even, let's say, cover up aspects of what's going on. And so they yes. really weave their way throughout. Uh, you get it in the Flatwoods case, uh, which, by the way, um, I you know, the reality, there's a lot of things that I thought were, were very well portrayed in this. The, the reality that there were a number of investigators who did go to Flatwoods, uh, West Virginia, 
to investigate this and notice like damage to the trees, for example. And, right. um, and the witnesses were actually very impressive. I mean, most were, were kids, but not all were little kids. They're, the leader, I think, was a 17-year-old yes, uh, 17, uh, exactly. scoutmaster. That's right. Uh, and then one, one adult. So uh, there, there were some very good witnesses there. Yeah. But you, you get this subtext of who's watching, who's uh, yeah. involved. And then, uh, well, can I mention the Russians? Are we allowed yeah. to... All right, so yeah, have- I think I think without giving too much away, I think we can. I think right. it's safe to say, even from the trailer, you, we you will understand that there is a an espionage yeah. aspect to the show, a, a a Cold War, a serious Cold War aspect to the show, and that that really spawned from the fact that listen, UFOs, UFO sightings, first of all, were obviously not just happening in the United States, and even Project Blue Book didn't only investigate cases that occurred in the United States. But this was a global phenomenon, and the Russians were just as interested in what are UFOs as we were. And of course, one of the predominant theories were was does our enemy have some sort of aircraft that we have yet to understand, some sort of top secret aircraft that is able to fly in our airspace that we don't understand? And the Russians felt that way as well. Is that what they're seeing in their skies? And at the time, you know, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, was the uh, Pinnacle Air Force Base, like that was one of the, like one of the epicenters of information of of secrecy of what you know of, of you know and that is where Project Blue Book uh, had its headquarters as well. Their small kind of like you know underfunded bunker, uh, you know, or, or bungalow, I should say, at 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 at, uh, at Wright Pat. And so what we wanted to do was was sort of take those ideas and be like, well, listen, you know, like I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's a stretch at all that if if there were Russian spy spy operatives in in the United States in the 1950s that that they wouldn't be interested in Wright Patterson and wouldn't and wouldn't be interested necessarily in a program like like Project Blue Book. And so what we do is we we take what was most likely a real a very real presence of 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 Russian sympathizers and of course Russian spy operatives. And insert that aspect into the show, but of course, like on a television series, you have to you are you know you are viewing a larger historical canvas through the perspectives of your characters. So that's where we make we you know we take some dramatization aspects of we're like okay, well, how can we insert something that was most likely present you know in that time period and you know and get that into the show and the world of our characters so that we so that audiences understand like this is a Cold War. Like the call, you know, to understand UFOs and to understand the secrecy and to understand the fear, uh, it's very, very tied in with with the Cold War because you know we didn't know if you know are we dealing with Russian spacecraft or you know Russian Russian you know aircraft or what. So yeah, that was the thing, and uh, I was I was basically really pleased to see the whole uh, Russian element in there, the espionage, and I thought you know yeah. just like with the covert a- aspects of the U.S. government. Uh, there was this international dimension of intrigue going on with the UFO phenomenon for sure. And I, I did end up understanding like, cause I wanted everything to be so historically exact and I'm realizing, okay, it's TV. They got to dramatize. So there was a lot of this uh, cloak and dagger that was brought right into high next life. And I sure. thought, Is really what Alec kind of, and I, I actually <laughs> think so, but, uh, but I thought, you know, look, it's, that's, that's the way it is. And, and it worked. Right. I mean, as, as a piece of drama, I, I have to say it, it works. It works nicely. Oh, good, good. Yeah, you know, listen. I mean, that is something where, yeah, we take, we certainly take some liberties that we take, and we take those liberties with the, you know, with the Heinex, uh family's uh, blessing. I mean, you know what I mean. That's one of the big things I want to emphasize too is that, um, you know, the 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 people who knew the man best are uh, read every script, are are now friends of mine, mm-hmm. uh, and are. Um, and are very much involved in 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 the show and the show's creation, and and they also understand. Yeah, you know, like listen, we want to we want to in, in some cases like that. It's like we're taking an ingredient that was real, and then we have to find a way. Like, okay, well, we can't just like how do we find a way to like make that relevant to the story we're telling, but still, but include it as a piece of the history because it is an important piece, you know. So then, and that's where we have to be. That's where you know, as a write as TV writers, we have to come up with sort of you know uh, creative ways that yes. That 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 are dramatizations, but that hopefully, my hope is that when people go back and they look, they'll be like, well, you know, everything that we do on the show has this kernel of of um, of a real operation, a real investigation, a real case, a real phenomena behind it. And yes, at times we're sort of mixing and matching as we as we, as we need to, but 
but it all is rooted in uh, true events and in, and, in, and in things that really happen. Yeah, it's it's uh, history with storytelling, and, and that happens all the time. What right. my hope is that uh, you know people who watch this show, and it, I really must say, and I'm not, I don't get paid for saying this, um, right. but I feel it's a very well crafted show with um, good script, uh, good interesting plot that moves it along, and, and all of that. So that's oh, good. Great. My, my hope is that it will um, uh, trigger or drive people into going a, even deeper into these uh, very interesting UFO events, which- Yeah, for the most that's really thing. my hope too. I mean, yeah. really like, that's my hope too, is that, is that audiences watches the show and they're like, they're like, oh, that was, that was entertaining, that's amazing. Wait a second, like, what's real here? Like, did these things occur? And then like, they go down the rabbit hole of searching into these cases and they're like, wow, like, is this really did happen? Or they, they meet certain, you know, different characters along the way. They're like, oh, I think it would, you know, I, I like, wow, that really, that was a real life person. and. And things like that. So, well, like, like for example, right? Exactly. Uh, like the Lubbock Lights. Like, who talks yeah. about the Lubbock Lights anymore? That's nineteen fifty-one, right. ancient times. I mean, I remembered reading about it a long time ago, thinking, "Wow, that's a really good case." But it's so far back now, and it's so far back it. now. And, and it's you did, a whole, yeah. you did a whole episode on it. You did an entire. We did, a whole, we did a whole episode on it, and that was one that was like that goes all the way back to before I sold the show, and I put together a Bible. I, I, you know, I, I, the, the Bible I put together, a Bible is sort of like a, like a series document that kind of lays out, here's the show, like, here's the, you know, here's the first season, here's where we want to go in future seasons. And, it, and I incorporated a lot of imagery into the Bible just because there's so many, there's so much wonderful, you know, um, authentic real life, uh, you know, uh, what, you know, what am I looking for? Like historical UFO pictures that I wanted to include to kind of, you know, and that of course the Lubbock Lights was, was, was right there. And what's great about a thing like the Lubbock Lights is, you know, probably some audiences who may not be familiar with the Lubbock Lights are familiar maybe with like the 1997 Phoenix Lights, right? Which was this massive V-shaped craft, right? Seen over Phoenix by 10,000 people, including the governor of Arizona who like sh shifted sides on the whole thing and said he doesn't know what the hell it was. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, even going back to the 50s, people are seeing these mysterious sort of V-shaped craft. And I do feel like there are certain patterns to this phenomena that happen over time you know that you know of course everyone's familiar with the disc but like a lot of times people see these massive like cylindrical shaped uh ufos or these v-shaped craft and so we you know that it's a great case for so many reasons and the fact that they're real life photographs and all that but it's also just for me it also we we always want to make sure that we're also connecting the past to the present and that like yeah these these kinds of sightings still occur um you know, uh, so it's 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 interesting. You know, it's, I would um, I would add, I would point out that, yeah. you know, the, well, the Lubbock Lights was uh, from I think August of fifty one, if I'm remembering correctly, and it yeah. was uh, a series of sightings actually. But yeah. one of the keys were these college university professors who were outside in the evening That's and right. we all saw this very clear. Um, but one of the things that you have in the episode, I, I I'm hoping this isn't really. Uh, are, are uh, electrical interference of automobile automobiles? Right. Yeah. Now, um, to be uh, nitpicky, I'm not aware of that happening at all during the Lubbock Lights uh, phenomenon. However, in Texas, just a few years later, six years later, actually, uh, there was a very famous case in Texas called Level Land. The Leveland, the Leveland, yeah, case. where I know it. this exactly happens. That's right. Multiple and cars, multiple cars stopping. Yes. And so what we did, I, 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 I the Leveland case is a great case, and actually yeah. a, a case like I'd love to do on its own right. But mm -hmm. yes, what we did there was we ended up sort of borrowing some aspects of the Leveland case because you know yeah. your, your first series of a TV show, you're just like, listen, what will we get? You know, <laughs> like what what can we use that that's like, real? Throw everything in there. Our, we also have to try to like, we want to make sure that we're telling a great story now, you know, as much as like we'd love to tell that great story down the line. So that, that is a, that's, that's a really good catch because that is precisely what it was. It was like, listen, all right, well, there's a great case in Texas a few years later called the level and uh, the level in case. Mm -hmm. And, um, how can we, how can we, you know, borrow a couple of elements there? And of course, you know, listen, Heineck talks about, you know, cars mysteriously stopping and electrical interference in all of his books and came, you know, th th this was one of these things that happened uh, multiple times in terms of like this strange uh, sort of electronic interference. So um, we felt that that was important, an important ingredient to include in the show regardless, you know what I mean? Just to be truthful to some of the, some of the high strangeness that this, that UFOs present, you know, that, and that they cause. 
I agree. I think that's a form of dramatization that's totally legit, and and you you want that, and it, it really added to the show. It didn't detract in the least. I, I liked it. Okay. Um, one thing I noticed about Heineck, and I'm sure this comes out like in, um, I mean, I'm sure everyone who's producing the show realizes Heineck had uh, one of, of all the people involved in UFO research in history, in yeah. history. Uh, he's in the top handful of people, in my opinion, for just uh, excellent memory of, of UFO cases. In other yes. words, he, yes. he really had a fantastic uh, knowledge Yes, of, yes. of cases and specific elements of each case and uh, was really able to pull those out very, very well. There, there is very few people uh, in, in the history of this research field who were his match for that. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, and it, that's exactly right. And we do try to capture that. I mean, we, in some degree, I mean, if you go and read his books, which I'm sure you have, and, and, and hopefully the audience just does as well. Like, even if you just read the UFO experience, you know, you'll get to those sections of the book where it is just pages and pages of data, right? And just meticulous detail and trying to look for search for patterns and daylight discs versus night nocturnal sightings. And do you know what I mean? Just really, really, because, you know, listen, he was the, the, the father of ufology in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? This is, he was, he's the first man who really tried to put a scientific categorization system on top of sort of a, 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 a mystery that we still don't understand. And, he was a brilliant guy and he had that kind of recall. And we, you know, we even do, we, you know, we, we, we do sort of play around with some of those aspects on the show and just trying to be truthful to just how brilliant and how, um, you know, how, how smart a man he really was, you know, and that was, yeah, that was important for us, even in the casting, it was like, who, who do you believe is the smart can, can, can believably be the smartest man in the room while also being, someone you um that you like and that you root for and that's why i felt so fortunate with aiden gillen because of course everybody knows him from like you know game of thrones and Littlefinger, so you know you can play that kind of like machiavellian smartest guy in the room thing with the wheels always turning but then if you go back and look at his work on the wire or queer as folk or anything else he's done he's also a just a wonderful actor and a, a watchable lovable guy and by the way he is in real life as well and so i knew he you know we, we felt really sure that he could bring all aspects that we would need to the character. And I think you, and I, you know, I think you hats off to him because he just, I, I'm blown away by, by what he did with it. Yes. No, his, uh, his uh, portrayal was really, really um, very, very good. I agree. And I was just trying to think of one other thing I wanted to ask you about this. We were actually about, we got about 10 minutes. Sure. As, far as I can see. Um, like Aiden Gillen, do I have any other notes here? <laughs> I'm just actually forgetting. Oh yeah. Uh, can we, uh, talk about the, uh, I just want to go back again. To yeah. How this whole thing is created, like how you do yeah. the TV show. So like sure. it starts, it starts as your inspiration. So you, yeah. were into this, you wrote everything out. Yep. I'll tell the, I'll tell the quick story just in yeah. case, like folk, maybe there's some folks out there who are, who are screenwriters or, 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 you know, are working on, working on TV shows of their own. I was, you know, prior to prior to working on Project Blue Book, I was working. Uh, I was a, I was a film writer with with uh, with you know um, no produced credits, but like had like sold a couple of things and gotten some stuff optioned and things like that. And but what I did was call um, for Project Blue Book is I I spec'd the pilot, meaning um, I didn't sell it on pitch because frankly I didn't um, I hadn't worked in TV before and it would be very hard for me to sell something on pitch. I wrote it. And I wrote it with the, uh, you know, of course, with with the dream of what has happened happening, um, but also just was was like, let me just throw my passion for this subject matter into this time period and try to tell and try to write a great writing sample, frankly, honestly. Um, and um, what ended up happening, and then and then my agent read it um, and really thought there was something there and then asked me would I put together this series Bible. So then I, and I already had a ton of research. So I sort of organized all that built out sort of what the series Bible would be. And then we shopped that. And, and it's funny in retrospect, uh, you know, it, it seems like it's so obvious that like history is where we would end up, but like, you know, it took a little time to kind of fit, figure out who's going to do the show and image movers read it really early and really liked it. So we were trying to get a producer on board before we took it to a network. Um, and the whole sort of, package just kind of came together at this at the same time um 
And then, you know, and they, and I was fortunate enough that, you know, they brought me in for a meeting and they had some thoughts and some ideas and I had some, uh, you know, we had a, a, a conversation about it and then I was fortunate enough that they were like, let's do it. And they, they, and so they bought, so with, at that time what they did was they just bought the, the screenplay and the, you know, the teleplay for the pilot episode and, and they purchased the Bible as well. And then, and then the process really begins. And then I was more just in the running with, uh, you know, every other show and TV that, that that gets developed but doesn't necessarily get made well and you, then, go, you go from the process of like this is my creation my thing yeah and then suddenly you have to learn like okay i've got a team now and yes. I, can't, I cannot yes. control yeah. every single element of it right so once we got the, the show <clears throat> the series and all that um then you know you know a number of things happened number one i was new to television so i'm the creator of the show but i'm not the showrunner of the show so we brought in a wonderful um veteran uh, showrunner who I want to make sure audiences know this as well, uh, is as passionate about this subject matter, um, as I am. Can you and describe what a showrunner does? I'm curious sure. about that. So a showrunner, a showrunner is like, you can think of them as the, like, like the, 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 the buck stops with the showrunner, sort of the, the main boss who oversees all the, all other departments. So if there is, you know, it is the final stamp on like even oversees all the key heads of departments. So like if there's any issue on the show that needs to be addressed, it's really the showrunner's job. The showrunner is like the director of the show. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, they um, they go in and they you know if there's a, if there's an issue that's going on with production design, they will go have that that conversation with that production designer. And their job is to ensure that the vision of the series is being made in physical reality. Now, in our case, and this happens a lot, um, I'm the creator of the show, so I had sort of mapped out the, the vision of the series. And then Sean comes on board, and we, I mean, we met for a month, just him and I, before we even opened up the writer's room, and really sort of mapped out for ourselves what we felt was was this first season gonna look like. Because we needed, we needed to make sure that we were in sync in terms of like, you know, my vision for the show and what he felt was going to be the best version as well. So that we, you know, and the, the, the great thing about it is, listen, not all of those marriages or arranged marriages as we joke sometimes, uh, work out ours. Uh, we are friends. We are, uh, we, you know, we really had the same vision for the show and he brought in so many ideas that, um, that I would have never thought of and took ideas I had and made them better and, and hopefully vice versa. You know what I mean? And we just sort of found a way to, uh, to build it together. And I, you know, and I, I would say that it was like captain co-captain. He, he was also great because he knew that I wanted to learn how to be a showrunner. And, 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 and I, so I, he kept me involved in everything. I mean, I, I made cast huge casting choices that, that, that he let me kind of make, you know, make my, you know, make the, the final decision on or, 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 you know, I mean, like he was, he was great. And then of course, you know, we have our collaborators with the network and studio as well. And they, you know, they have, um, they're as invested as we are too, and they want to make sure you know. And they're they're chiming in, and then we also have our non-writing producers in in Bob Zemeckis' team, and I'd be remiss not to plug them, which is uh, Jack Rapke and Jackie Levine, who are just wonderful producers. They are uh, veterans. I mean, I've done every Bob Zemeckis movie there is. They're also doing you know they just produced Manifest for those who watch that show, and I thought they did a great job there. It's like the number one show on TV or something. So it was just a awesome group getting together and as a hive mind sort of figuring out what is the best path forward and how can we make the best series possible. And you, um, and you mentioned that Sean, the showrunner was very passionate about, about having a, a quality show. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if that's the same Sean that interviewed me. I don't, oh, I don't know if that is. There was, I don't know. <laughs> there was a team and I'm trying to remember his let, oh no. Uh, what was your Sean's last name? Jablonski? No, a different guy. Oh, okay. I had someone yeah. who came here. I didn't think I'd be that important for them to come to my house uh, for him to interview me. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. good that um, that he shared your passion. I guess my my final question would be: um, I mean, I, you seem very happy with how the show's turned out. I, in I mean, from a drama and from a historical point of view, uh, I think it does very well. Yeah. Was there something that you really want to make sure you convey substantively about the UFO phenomenon in this show? And I guess I would ask, yeah. what are your main hopes? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, yeah. What I would say too is, um, you know, uh, I think it's important for audiences to know before they watch the show is that we um, we are always towing that line between um, 
earthly explanations and unearthly explanations, even in even in cases or or moments where it's like, oh wow, we really leaned into like an X Files y kind of moment. Like he's staring at like you know, there, there's an iconic shot that's out there, so I can talk about it about Heineck looking at an alien in a tank. And all I will say about that is, just like everything else on the show, there are always two sides to the story about what's really happening there, and um, that's really important to me because I know that many people out there are UFO, uh, you know, believers or believe there's you know the reality of this phenomenon. But I would, you know, just as many, I would say probably half the population believes that are that, you know that are skeptical of this stuff, and I want. That's the audience that I want just as much as I want both sides to really come in and, and, and view the show and look at it. And, and then, you know, and then I would love, I really would love that our show in some small way helps to continue the conversation that men like you are already having with the greater community out there about like, what is, what is the true nature of what's really going on here? You know what I mean? And Heineck, I, you know, for me personally, I fall in the Heineck camp of like, there are many possible theories about what's really happening. And, um, you know, and, and each answer is, is, is as, is as mysterious and fascinating as the next. And the extraterrestrial hypothesis is one hypothesis, but there are many. And, um, and I, and you actually, you actually introduced a few of them in the series and yeah. I don't know how much I'm supposed to give away here, but anyway, there's some covert ops explanations and secret science explanations and yes. it's floated out there in various episodes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, and I think that's, we're trying to be truthful to the fact that, listen, some people think we're dealing with, you know, um, you know, top secret military aircraft that is so advanced that it appears extraterrestrial. Some people think we are dealing with literal like nuts and bolts, uh, you know, spacecraft from other planetary systems visiting us. Some people think that we are dealing with hyperdimensional beings that live on top of our reality and somehow we share our planet with them. Some people think that UFOs are are in, are in fact or like living systems in some way and are a, a, a organism of life that we have yet to understand. Some people think that UFOs are time machines from the future and we are being visited by our future selves and UFOs are evidence of time travel. Some people think that we live in a simulated reality and UFOs represent that fact and they are the game masters interacting with the game sphere. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And the truth is like, I don't, I don't have the answer, you know what I mean? Nor, nor would I ever claim to, uh, nor really, you know, as far as I know, nobody has that answer yet. Uh, and so what our show tries to do is open up all those possibilities so people can go back, look at the information and decide for themselves. I love that whole explanation that you almost had a drop mic moment there. When you <laughs> <looked> up <laughs> all the explanations of UFOs. Right. That was okay. really good. Yeah. yeah. I, I got, I have just been told here, we, we, I don't know how much time you got. We can go a little longer if, if I can, I got time. I'm happy well, to continue. Yeah. I've got questions here that yeah. uh, Tracy snuck in and gave me a list of questions. Okay. She's following along here. Sure. And um, <clears throat> I don't know if you want to get into this. Our, we have uh, people watching right now, and they, they right. would, some of them or one of them would like to know if you have ever had a UFO experience. And if so, are you willing to talk about it? Yes. Okay. So um, I never had, as far as I know, prior to recently, and I did share, I like, I wasn't going to share this. And then I was like, why am I not going to share this? That'd be so against the philosophy of what the show really wants to do, which is just, is to continue the discussion. But I guess like me, like so many other people who have these experiences that were a little like embarrassed by it. And this happened to me um, uh, about a year and it happened after I had sold the show. I was walking home at night. It was about 10 30 at night. I live in an area uh, kind of near the Grove in, in, in Los Angeles. And, and I share this just cause it's, it's, Nothing like this has ever happened to me before or since. I happen to be on the phone with a friend at the time, which I hardly ever am at like 10, 30 or 11 at night. And I'm really glad that I was because I think I would have panicked even more than I did panic. But I was walking, I was about a block or two away from my house, super quiet neighborhood. And then out of the trees, all the houses in my area are like two stories tall. Out of the trees just sort of comes like a, what I describe as a uh, kind of a like a like a tear like a, a teardrop shaped green self luminescent balloon or something like that like kind of just comes out of the trees and I think I did whatever you every um, you know UFO witness does and that that even like Rupelt and Heine talk about in their books is like at first I thought it was you know like your mind goes through the process of just like oh what is that so I go at first I thought it was like a drone like a like one of those like kind of propeller you know like sort of micro drones but i'm like but it's i don't hear the the buzzing and i don't see like propellers i just see this sort of like 
sort of like what it, what it, what actually is sort of similar to what we explore in a, in a, in a case, which is the classic uh, green fireballs sort of phenomena. And, and, and it kind of stops and then just what in my, and this could have been completely my own perception, sort of, I felt like it almost like started to move a little towards where I was. And I'm on the phone with my buddy and I, and I'm just gonna be completely honest. I kind of panicked and I ran and I kind of ran to my house. And I like ran under it. And then it just kind of continued on in the tree line and disappeared behind the trees. And I went upstairs and my buddy's like laughing on the phone, like you're losing your mind. And, you know, and I've never seen anything like that since. I never saw anything like that before. It was just one of those strange things. And it, uh, it, um, it affected me. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like for like months, I would park my car and I was kind of like, that's that is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and so I, 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 that I sat on that for about a year, and I was like, I don't want to be like the guy with the UFO show who like claims to have a UFO experience, but that did happen to me. And then I, I it suddenly like lightning, it just hit me like, what are you talking about? Like that, you are being completely hypocritical if you if you don't embrace what you felt happened to you and be open about it. Um, so that happened, and then nothing like that has ever happened to me since. And uh, it was just one of those strange things. I'm really glad you shared that, David. I really appreciate it. I mean, everyone has gone through this. I remember when I first started researching UFOs, I didn't want to tell anyone about it. And then I realized, wow, I've researched so much, I better start telling people about it. Yeah. And what I discovered is, and I, I assume you've discovered this as well, like when you are brave enough to talk about your experience with other people in a forthright way, in a very open way, uh, most people are really interested. They want to know more. They find it uh, intriguing. and. And yeah. they don't think they don't think you're crazy, by the way, because it's such a widespread phenomenon. That people have witnessed bizarre things. Your sighting, that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, like, you know, one of the privileges that I've had now working on the show is like is is I do now have people who will come up and, and share their experiences, you know, more. And I'm sure this happens to you. Um, and it's it's great. I actually really love hearing about other people's um case, you know, like their experiences with UFOs because it's so yeah, I was at a two-year-old, my daughter, I have a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, I was at a two-year-old's birthday party, and the grandparents of one of the kids that was there was like, told me this crazy story of this like rectangular shaped like block of light that like was the size of a truck that chased her car in the 70s and then shot right back up in the space. And I was like, I'm like, can you, I'm like, when did that happen? And can we use that on a future season? If it, like, you know, at the time, you know, it, it, I mean, people's stuff are, the, the people's reports are just, it's, it's weird. I mean, it's just, and it is pervasive. And um, there is some, you know, I think, I think that all we can do is kind of be more open about it. And that's how we get answers, you know, to what's, to what's happening, you know? I think you'll you'll find as uh, people like know like you're a UFO guy now because you did a UFO series that right. you, a lot of folks are going to come up to you and describe yeah. just those types of things to you. I I cannot tell you how many people have come up to me and told me their stories because you know they feel safe because they they know that this is someone who's who studied it and is probably interested and is not going to laugh at them and that That's alone right. is going to bring many many more people to you. I want to ask you one more thing here. I've got a couple yeah. of questions that are they're sort of related. Sure, yeah, sure. Why not? Um, one person asked, why do you think it's important to keep bouncing back to Blue Book when decades have passed? That's kind of an interesting loaded question. Oh, that's a great question. And, and then the other person writes, why now? Why yeah. do this show now? Uh, and great question. connections to hash hashtag disclosure. Right. So that's all interesting stuff. I mean, what, all what really interesting stuff. So I'll answer these sort of why now and why why is it important to go back to Blue Book because I think those two things are connected. So for me, it was always really important. First and foremost, it's important uh, that this is a you know that I get asked the question a lot of times of like you know like how come there were so many UFO sightings in the fifties and sixties but there aren't any UFO sightings anymore? Uh, to which I was like, that's <laughs> not true. That is not true at all. In fact, like. Two weeks ago, there was a there was a huge UFO sighting where three commercial airline pilots in Ireland, you know, witnessed something they couldn't explain. You can go online and, on the BBC and hear their recordings to one another. And in fact, it was it was Aidan Gillen who lives in Ireland who who informed the team at Project Blue Book about it. But you know, th this has been going on a long time. Like you know, um, Shaoshan Airport in China was shut down in 2010 because there was this weird cylindrical beam of light that they couldn't explain. 2006 at Chicago O'Hare's airport, you know, the list goes on and on. So for me, one of the things was that was important was that 
this is a mystery that persists to this day. And our show tries to go back and look at sort of the origins of the modern UFO era, which most UFO historians believe kind of began in 1947. And then obviously Blue Book was coming shortly thereafter. Um, so that was important to us. But then also sort of thematically just looking at other aspects of the show, whether, you know, and unfortunately there are a lot of parallels between our current uh, political climate or geopolitical climate and the 1950s, whether it be, you know, Blue Book in many ways was a fake news organization that would go out there and, and you know, even though it didn't necessarily sit right with some of the people who were making these statements, they would uh, explain, you know, their job is to kind of control the narrative and control public perception about this issue. And that, of course, it happens all the time, regardless of which political end of the spectrum you're on. I think we can right. all agree that in some regards, there is a fake news aspect to spinning events towards one way or the other, for, towards the favor of what your of what your political beliefs may be. Um, but there are other things too. It's like you know, in in, in you know, the, the fear of invasion. You know what I mean? I think fear of nuclear war. Just the, you know, unfortunately, that's a reality now. It was a reality then. Um, you know, in the 1950s, there was the comic book explosion as sort of a like, you know, sort of a reaction to that of like, oh gosh, if only like superheroes could save us. Our present day version of that is comic book movies, right? It's like the we are totally. It makes me crazy. That's so right. Oh, I'm not. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. No more. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, and um, you know, uh, gosh, you know, I mean, obviously Russia. You know, just the Cold War aspect and and the way Russia plays in the news now and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there are certain mirrored themes that continue to be, um, unfortunately, sort of issues in our society. And I think uh, it's a weird thing. I mean, it's like, in a way, it's for, it's fortunate for the show, I guess, and that it, I feel it is topical. We explore that then and, and as, a, as a mirrored lens by which to look at now. Although, yeah, of course, I, 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 I wish that that wasn't the case. Um, and then I think there was the question sort of about disclosure. And I've, I've certainly been asked the question, I've been asked two sides of that question. I've been asked the question, is this show just further misinform disinformation used to, to, used to confuse the public about UFOs? And so I, I'll deal with that question first, which is absolutely not. In fact, our, our goal is the reverse. Our goal is to take, is to set a, a series that is rooted in real life events um, and certainly we do take some dramatic liberties, but then we also want to make sure to emphasize, no, please go back and look up these real life cases. Tune in after the show where you will learn more about the real life case that inspired this week's episode of Blue Book. Do your own research and come up and make your own decisions. Because at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're telling a compelling television series, um, but, and tell, you know, story, but but the, the truth really is stranger than fiction. And then I've been I've been I've been uh, asked about the flip side of that equation, which is: Are we in any way part of the disclosure movement, sort of, sort of preparing the American public um, for uh, for you know for 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 disclosure and for you know for the admittance of a UFO reality? To which I will also say no, or at least I can say, as far as I know, no. You know what I mean? Listen. History is, is, is a, and listen, by the way, I would completely be asking both these questions if I weren't like the creator of the show. You know what I mean? I would totally want to know this. Uh, as far as I know, no. History what, saw potential in the show, wanted to tell a great drama, and they were like, this is a wonderful topic to explore. Did somebody up the chain of command? History is a subsidiary of blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I, that I, would I, be my question. That would yeah, I will not be out, but I will say that 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 no. I mean, like in all seriousness, mm -hmm. our, 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 we just are people who felt there was an amazing story here about Project Blue Book to be told through the lens of this wonderful astrophysicist and brilliant guy, and just try to do our best job of of rooting it in fact, but telling a dramatic series so that we can educate and entertain. And education is everything. I think that like. The more people look into this stuff, the more people can 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 you know find out the, their own truths and and look at what you know what's documented and all that kind of stuff. The better, because that's what's going to sort of bring about the true movement of change. And hopefully, the show gets to be a uh, you know a small part of that. You know, in terms of just hitting a wider audience, so people know that there was the Gorman incident, know that there was the level blades, know that there was you know some of the other cases that I won't divulge, even though I want to. That like that really happened. You know that we explore on the show, and I'm that doing we very good here, and I'm not going into it uh, either. I'm gonna 
Yeah. yeah that happened. But they, 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 the, the case is in one ten, you know, in our in our in our in our series finale, which I will not. Talk. You pick you pick good cases. I I definitely would agree. Uh, can I ask you one? Of the, I know I'm supposed to let you go here, but yeah, I, I'm getting some questions here from people. So, how did the cast feel about the UFO subject? Oh, uh, well, how does the cast feel about the UFO? Yeah, UFO? or the cast or the people involved in general? I would say that all of them came to it a with a. A deep respect that they could tell that that we that the show was going to take this matter really seriously. I think that there was a range of sort of um, beliefs in terms of like some people were you know were unsure, other people were like, oh my gosh, this is this is um, you know something I've been I've been fascinated, and I and I, I think I'll let them speak to their own beliefs. You know what I mean? I, rather than paraphrase, what I will say though is that we also had our actors do uh you know what they were willing to do we shared all of our research with them so we shared like you know ed rupelt's book and 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 Heineck's book and we had a we had a massive document that sort of kind of s summarized a bunch of cases that we had also talked shared with our writers frankly because like we wanted to make sure our writers were aware of this and our writers were great and did you know and as writers should did a deep dive it was a small room we had five writers myself sean jablonski our showrunner and three other writers and but they really went on that journey as well and and what i will say is that that's a journey that continues for them like they are not on the show right now and i but i'm in touch with aiden i'm in touch with michael uh and they they that's it they you know and they continue to look into this stuff i get i'll get sent stuff about ufos from them which is like so great um and you know, I'd be remiss not to include our network executive in this as well. Like I went to like, I mean, I literally went to a Bob Lazar documentary premiere uh, for, you know, you know, and believe what you will about Bob Lazar, but I was just curious to see what that, what that documentary. Oh, well, I, I did a long interview with Jeremy Corbell uh, not long before that came out. I've known Jeremy for years. Oh, and great. the creator of that documentary. It's yeah. fine and documentary. It was our network executive who, 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 uh, who informed me about the, the movie? I think I had seen I'd seen one, one of two of Jeremy's previous movies, and I was like, "Heck yes!" So the two of us like got to go to this thing and just sort of sit up in the bleachers and just be like, "Let's enjoy it and let's let's see what we'll see what's there." And 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 that's the thing I think with one of those things where once hopefully I think I do feel that the people who've become involved in the show have also become involved in wanting to know uh, more about 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 the phenomena than even we cover on the show, which is quite a bit. But I will also say that they think, fortunately, they all were really into doing the research as well. And I think once you do the research, I think you can't not help that then it, it stays with you. Cause like the more you dig, the more, the more you uncover and the more like your head, you know, more, the more mind blowing it is. I got to say, that's uh, very much my experience working with a lot of TV people. I've been uh, shooting documentaries with folks for a long time. And the, the typical thing is like a, a team will come in and, the producer and the, the people involved will not always really be that knowledgeable going in to yeah. the phenomenon because it's not their job. Their job is to shoot uh, yeah. television. But what I've all I've often, I guess I should say, notice happening is like they, like I, I will often see, especially when they're interviewing me, I see the eyes changing and I see the expression changing yeah. and, I, and they start to think, wow, like, is this actually real? And, and there yeah. is a kind of conversion factor there that is. a lot of these TV people, like they're not deep experts, but they right. become very interested. It's they really do. an interesting thing this, to observe. It is. And we had the benefit of being on history where they obviously had already, you know, there are a, you know, a number of UFO documentaries and things that they have produced. So they, they have pockets of their network that are really have, you know, great, they have amazing archival footage. Like we went back and found a bunch of like cool archival stuff. But, you know, so I, I feel so fortunate that they were a network that cares about the subject matter already, um, which is, I think, one of the reasons why they wanted to tell the story, as opposed to if it was just a different, you know, a ca cable or a broadcast network, which really would just care, like, let's just, we need eyeballs and only eyeballs, yeah, you know, and not, and, and it doesn't matter what's true or what's rooted in truth or any of that kind of nature, you know? Hey, last question, yeah. Thomas. Uh, yeah, cool. This is kind of relevant. This tacks on to what you were just saying. Did any of the show's info come directly from Hynex files? Like clearly a lot of it came from the Blue Book files. Yes. Was, was there anything in addition to that of Hynex himself? Um, um, I mean, there's his book, but is there anything more than that that might have been? Um, we looked at all of his books. We looked at, uh, we did have his two sons on board. They didn't have, 
uh, like um, Heineken, you know, we did ask about that. Like, are there private notes and things of that nature? We weren't given anything of that. I will say this. I did have the pleasure to interview the last living director of Project Blue Book, which is Lieutenant Colonel Robert Friend, who is still alive. I met he, him. Yeah. Oh, you've met him too. I yeah. met him, yeah. He yeah. Is, he's unbelievable. He's unbelievable. Um, and he was a, for those who don't know who he is, he was a Tuskegee Airman in World War II. I believe like like Cuba Gooding Jr. like played him in a movie or something like that. Or like, or like at least was like in the, you know, in the same squadron as his squadron. And um, he uh, was the, you know, is the last, one of the directors of Project Blue Book who knew Heineck and worked with Heineck. And so I had the, the, the joy of sitting down with, with, with him. This was before the show even got picked up in the series. Um, just because we didn't know, you know, like, you know, he's, we just wanted to get this on tape um, for about two hours. And I, I just probed him with every question I could get. And what, you know, one of the most interesting answers I got was, listen, you know, if, if Project Blue Book had found conclusive evidence that UFOs represent an intelligence that we have yet to understand, would you have shared that then? And would you share that now? And he said, if we had found something of that nature, no, we would never, we would not share it with you. Yeah, uh, he's a heck of a guy, very impressive man, very elderly. Yeah. And I found the same thing. He was just, he came across as very much a skeptic about UFOs, but yeah, sure. he was very cagey. He was very, cagey, was very cagey, cagey, a lot of his it's answers. Interesting yeah. interesting stuff came up because, you know, we, we, you know, we we delve into what some audiences we never refer to it as the majestic twelve, and I you know I don't want to necessarily go down that that rabbit hole, but we do. We I talked to him about that as well, and he was very open that yes, I, I had heard rumblings of a, of a of a of a group of men even then that was sort of you know under under uh, you know that had access to all of our case files and was able to kind of like uh, kind of come and go as they please under under you know under their own sort of uh, clearance, and I was like, well, that's. That's fascinating because that does seem to connect with like even what Edmund Pelt talked about in terms of a group that that existed that was sort of able to gain access to their files as well. So, yeah, it, you know, regardless of where you sort of fall on like the MJ twelve documents and things of that nature, there certainly were, as you say, Richard, multiple pockets of of people looking into this, and Blue Book was only one. And it's. Uh, it's, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's interesting. It's, it's part of what makes the drama of the show interesting that there's yeah. all of this intrigue. Well, look, I, I think that's probably all we have time for, but sure. I, I really want to thank you, David O'Leary, for, for joining me on this. It was a great conversation. I think a lot of people became interested. And uh, can you tell people when this series begins? Yes, I can. And thank you guys so much for, 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 for staying on if you're still there. Uh, it, it airs uh, Tuesday, January 8th at 10 p.m., 9 central on History. And uh, please uh, please check it out. You know, I, uh, and, and if you like what you see, please uh, tell your friends about it too. You know? Oh, one thing I'll add because yeah. I was just checking this out. Um, so History Channel has its own, uh, the website, I should say, has its own yes. kind of uh, interesting features relating to the show which are also worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, one of the great things they've been doing is uh, you know, doing going back and 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 writing sort of articles about the real life cases that we explore on the show that I'm sure you that you're going to probably go into more depth in that in that sort of, you know, tune in after the show segment right. about the real life cases. So yeah, I mean, they really want to make sure that people get that uh, you know, we're just we're ripping things from the head off the headlines and things off of reports from the from the Project Blue Book files. Uh, uh, you know, and, um, and that, that, you know, there's something going on here. There's something going on that that's truly strange. And, you know, well, this is very enjoyable. I really appreciate your time, David O'Leary. And, uh, Thank hopefully you. we'll chat again and yes. I'm really wishing you and the show lots of success. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thanks Take care. So much. Bye.